Piston Engines The piston engine, reciprocating engine, is the engine type that you will see most commonly. In a piston engine, the pistons and connecting rods move up and down in a reciprocating motion. Because the engine is the heart of the automobile, the following sections discuss the construction and operation of the most important piston engine parts and how they work together to develop power. Figure 9.3 illustrates the piston engine components. Exam alert! Make sure that you understand all the major components of an automotive engine and types of engine design. Pistons and piston rings The piston transmits the force created by the combusting fuel through the connecting rods to the crankshaft. In the four-stroke cycle engine, there is always one piston delivering power, one exhausting gases, one drawing in air fuel, and one compressing the air fuel mixture. The piston rings hold the piston in place and prevent combustion heat and pressure from extending down into the crankcase. They also keep oil in the crankcase from leaking into the combustion chamber. A car will use too much oil when the piston rings are worn. Piston rings also conduct heat from the head of the piston into the cylinder wall so that the cylinder and piston can expand and contract at the same rate. Pistons can be forged or cast from aluminum alloys. Cast pistons are very light and can generate higher engine speeds, while forged pistons are less expensive, provide a stronger, denser piston, and have better heat distribution throughout the piston. Cylinder Block Most automotive engines today combine the cylinders and crankcase in one large metal casting called a cylinder block. All other engine components either fit inside or fasten to the outside of the block. The number and arrangement of cylinders determine the shape of the cylinder block. The two lower block designs are the V design and the Y design. The designs are similar in overall construction, but the Y design flares at the bottom to give better attachment area. Cylinder blocks are either cast aluminum or cast iron. Crankcase The crankcase houses and supports the crankshaft and can be split or one piece. Split cases allow easier maintenance, while one-piece crankcases provide better rigidity and are less expensive to manufacture. Both kinds of crankcases can be either cast iron or cast aluminum. Although aluminum is lighter than cast iron and allows for better head dissipation, cast iron is stronger and provides a more solid housing for the crankshaft. Small, air-cooled engines usually have aluminum crankcases, while larger engines have cast iron crankcases. Cylinders The cylinder is a tube in the cylinder block that holds the pistons. The cylinder is closed at the bottom, and the piston slides up and down inside the cylinder. The space between the top of the cylinder and the top of the piston is the combustion chamber where the engine compresses and ignites the air-fuel mixture. The cylinders are usually cast iron and made to very tight tolerances. However, some cylinders are made of aluminum, although this makes the engine lighter and provides good heat dissipation, aluminum tends to wear rapidly. Cylinder Heads The cylinder head is a large aluminum or iron casting bolted to the top of the engine block. A head gasket between the cylinder head and the block forms a gas and liquid tight seal. An inline engine has one cylinder head and AV engine has two cylinder heads, one for each bank of cylinders. The cylinder head forms the combustion chamber above each piston. Each combustion chamber has a threaded hole for a spark plug and intake and exhaust ports. Connecting rods and the crankshaft To use the power developed by burning gasoline, the piston must connect to other parts. The connecting rods and crankshaft are the components that utilize and transmit this power, see figure 9. 3. As the combusting air-fuel mixture expands and forces down the piston, the connecting rod that attaches to both the piston and the crankshaft causes the crankshaft to turn and translate that power to the drivetrain. This action changes reciprocating motion to rotating motion and also turns the belts for accessories such as the oil, fuel, and water pumps, the valve train, the alternator, the distributor, and the fan. To produce a continuous rotary motion, the piston must return to its starting point at TDC. 
After the piston pushes down the crankshaft, a counterbalancing weight has enough momentum to return the piston to TDC for the next charge of air and fuel. The crankshaft in a four-cylinder engine has four throws that attach to the connecting rods and are directly in line with the cylinders. The throws are normally spaced 180 degrees apart to allow a different stroke to occur in one of the cylinders at any given time. However, the crankshaft in a six-cylinder engine spaces the six crank throws 120 degrees apart. V8 engines have four crank throws, and each throw has two connecting rods one rod for each cylinder. Although the throws of a V8 crankshaft can be spaced 180 degrees apart, most V8s space them at 90 degrees. Bushings and bearings Friction occurs wherever moving parts meet and cause heat and wear. Lubricants reduce friction, but another way to do so is to make the contacting parts from materials other than the part material. For instance, copper, tin, and lead are good materials for parts that rub against steel or cast iron. For this reason, bushings and bearings at major points in an engine are made of material different from that of the parts they support. These are the two most common automotive bearings. Bushings, full, round sleeves that are pressed into place in a component hole and machined on the inside to fit a shaft. Insert bearings have two halves that fit over a shaft and a cap as part of the housing assembly. Roller bearings, support the front and rear crankshaft main bearing positions. All bearings must have oil clearance, meaning that when oil is pumped into the oil clearance area of a bearing, the combination of oil pressure and rotation of the shaft creates a skin of oil between the shaft and bearing. That way, the shaft rests on the oil film instead of the shaft, so there is no metal-to-metal -metal contact. Seals and gaskets Seals and gaskets are important in automotive connections because they minimize friction and prevent lubrication from leaking at the automotive joints and connections. Gaskets are flat compression seals used between two automotive parts that are bolted together. Without a gasket, the tight compression of the two parts would cause irregularities on the part surfaces to leak. The gasket material compresses and fills up these irregularities when the two parts are tightened. To form a pressure-tight seal, gaskets are made of copper for low combustion pressure, steel and graphite, or other non-asbestos material, for higher combustion pressures, and steel or aluminum for very high combustion pressures. Cork, rubber, and paper are used for gaskets in very low temperature and low pressure conditions. One of the most important automotive gaskets is the cylinder head gasket, which seals in the pressures from combustion in the cylinders. The head gasket also seals the lubrication and cooling passages between the block and the cylinder head to prevent cooling and lubricating fluid loss and prevent fluid intermixing. Seals provide leak protection around rotating or sliding shafts which a normal gasket cannot do. Of the many different seal types, lip seals and o-ring seals are the most common. Lip seals enclose a lubricant inside a bearing area to keep dirt and other abrasive materials out of the joint, while o-rings are synthetic rubber, ring-shaped seals that are used to cushion and seal in both moving and non-moving parts. Camshafts and camshaft drives a small crankshaft gear on the front end of the crankshaft turns the large camshaft gear once every two revolutions of the crankshaft. A large pump on the end of the camshaft drives the fuel pump, and a gear on the camshaft drives the distributor and the oil pump. Valve lifters Valve lifters ride on the camshaft and rise as it rotates. Valve lifters are made of iron and are hardened to prevent wear. The two types of valve lifters are solid and hydraulic. Push rods Overhead valve engines transfer the cam lobe and lifter motion up to the cylinder head by a push rod. Most push rods are hollow to lessen weight and allow pressurized oil to flow through the push rod up to the rocker arm assembly for lubrication. Rocker arms The rocker arm mounts to the cylinder head so that when the push rod lifts one side of the rocker arm, the other side moves correspondingly. The rocker arm converts upward motion to downward motions. The fulcrum of many rocker arms is off-center, so that the downward motion to open the valve is 1.5 times greater than the lift of the cam lobe, a 1-15 ratio. Valve Train 
The valve train opens and closes the intake and exhaust ports at the correct time in the cycle. In a four-stroke cycle, air and fuel enter the cylinder through the intake port, are trapped and burned there, and are expelled as exhaust gases through the exhaust port. The valve train is a mechanism above the pistons that regulates the opening and closing of these two ports. Both valves are closed during the compression and power strokes. Engine Systems The engine uses several interoperating systems to generate energy and motion. The engine system comprises the lubrication, cooling, fuel, ignition, and electrical systems. In the following sections, we discuss each system, its function, and the other systems with which it works. Exam Alert Be sure that you know the major automotive systems and their primary components and understand individual system function and interoperability with other automotive systems. Lubrication System the lubrication system circulates oil among moving parts to allow them to move freely and to reduce friction and metal-to-metal -metal contact. The circulating oil also carries heat from the hot engine and cleans dirt and deposits from the engine parts. Oil on the cylinder wall seals the rings to improve engine compression. All moving engine parts require support, such as guides, shafts, and bearings, and friction increases with the increase of weight or force. When an engine has to compensate for less internal friction, it can develop more power. Most automotive engines use a lubricating system that forces pressurized oil to parts and bearings. Two-stroke engines use a different lubrication system than a four-stroke engine uses. A special oil-fuel mixture goes into the crankcase, where the oil circulates around the components and penetrates into the areas that need lubrication. In some engines, the gasoline and oil are mixed and poured into the fuel tank, while other engines have two separate tanks for fuel and oil. The following sections focus on the lubrication systems for a four-stroke cycle engine. This discussion includes details on lubricants and components of the oil distribution, filter, and lubrication system as a whole. Lubricants Petroleum oil is the most common lubricating fluid, and is made or refined from crude petroleum, such as gasoline, kerosene, and fuel oil. However, non-carbon-based, synthetic, lubricants are becoming more popular. Synthetic oils reduce friction better than petroleum oil so that the engine can provide more power and achieve better fuel mileage. Synthetic oils also operate in a wider temperature range than petroleum oil, which means that you don't need to change synthetic oils as often as you do petroleum oil. The most important property of oil is its viscosity, which is a measure of its fluidity. The Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, determines the temperature requirements for oil at 0 degrees F low and 210 degrees Fahrenheit high. Thin oil has a low viscosity number, such as SAE 20, and thicker oil receives a higher number, such as SAE 40 or 50. The oil container states the viscosity number, and your car's owner's manual tells you what grade of oil you should use in your car. Most automobiles need SAE 30 in the summer and SAE 20 in the winter. On the side of the oil container, you might see a designation of 10W40. The W indicates that the oil has met the SAE's low temperature requirements. But if the oil has no W, such as SAE 30, that oil meets the high temperature ratings. Bearing grease is a very thick, petroleum-based lubricant specifically for packing bearings. Because bearings endure a lot of heat, weight, and motion, bearing grease needs to be thick and very stable so that it doesn't break down easily. Like oil, bearing greases are available as petroleum-based and synthetic. Unlike oil, the thickness of bearing grease is measured not as viscosity, but as penetration. The higher the penetration number is, the softer the grease is. Oil pan. The oil pan stores and collects the oil from the engine. Baffles inside the pan prevent oil from sloshing away from the oil pickup area during hard stops. Oil pump The camshaft drives the engine oil pump, which forces oil through the engine. The resistance to this flow results in a pressure buildup that provides more force for the oil distribution. If the oil pressure gets too high, a ball or plunger pushes into position to release the pressure and send some oil back into the pan. As soon as pressure returns to normal, the relief valve spring retracts. 
Oil Filter The oil pump draws the oil from the oil pan and pushes it through the oil filter, which cleans the oil before it reaches the engine parts. The oil filter threads onto the outside of the cylinder block so that it can be easily changed. The filter element, which can be cotton, wool, or paper, and canister assembly are usually one piece. When the oil passes through the filter, dirt and acid stick to the paper, and only the cleaned oil goes through to the engine block. After a lot of use, the oil filter becomes clogged, and if oil is not passing through the element, it isn't getting to engine parts, either. However, when the filter element clogs, pressure inside the canister pushes a bypass valve open to let the oil, though unfiltered, go around the filter element and directly into the engine. Oil Passages From the filter, the oil enters the oil passages of the block and flows into channels in the cylinder block. From the main header, the oil goes to oil clearance areas at main bearings. From the main bearings, oil also flows through the cylinder block, through the crankshaft, and the main journals to the connecting rod journals and through the connecting rods. After oil passes through the lubrication system, it runs down the inside of the engine back to the oil pan. Oil from the connecting rod bearings is thrown off the crankshaft to lubricate the cylinders, pistons, and rings. Excess oil passes through oil holes in the piston and back into the oil pan. Monitoring oil level and pressure. If the oil level is too low, the pump cannot provide enough oil to lubricate the engine. An oil dipstick, located in the engine compartment, extends into the oil reservoir and is used to check the oil level. Markings on the dipstick show how much oil you have and indicate when you need to add oil. You do not add oil at the dipstick, but at the entrance to the oil reservoir, which has a cap that is normally marked oil. A gauge on the instrument panel indicates the oil pressure, and an oil pressure warning light warns you if your oil pressure is below a safe level. Cooling System Normal engine operation creates tremendous amounts of heat, and the cooling system removes some of this heat to maintain efficient engine operating temperatures. The cooling system removes engine heat by either air cooling, liquid cooling, or a combination. Liquid cooling dissipates more heat than air cooling and reduces engine noise. Air cooling An air cooling system circulates air around hot engine parts to dissipate the heat. The components that get the hottest, such as the cylinders and cylinder heads, have fins to direct the most air into contact with the greatest amount of hot metal. Air cooling may use air flow from natural air flow, called draft cooling, from fans, or from a combination of the two. Draft cooled engines require the vehicle to be moving for air to circulate around the engine. When the vehicle is idling but not moving, there is no airflow and the engine may overheat. However, if an engine has forced air circulation, an air pump draws air in and forces it around the engine block. The cylinders and cylinder heads are finned and usually covered with sheet metal shrouding to direct the air. A thermostat controls air intake when the engine is cold to prevent overcooling. The advantage of air cooling over liquid cooling is that air-cooled engines weigh less and are smaller. For that reason, this system is used with motorcycle and aircraft engines. Liquid cooling. Liquid cooling systems circulate liquid around hot engine parts to dissipate heat. A liquid-cooled engine is cast with coolant passages in the block and that surround each cylinder. When the engine is running, engine heat passes through the cylinder walls and transmits to the liquid coolant circulating through the passages. Engines overheat because of sustained operation in very hot temperatures, because the coolant level is too low or is not the proper mix, or because of stress in another primary system. When an engine overheats, the coolant boils and stops circulating. The oil in the engine also starts to break down because of the heat, and that can damage bearings and other moving parts if it continues. A thermostat controls the coolant flow into the radiator from the engine, and a coolant temperature warning light on the instrument panel indicates when the coolant temperature is too high. If an engine becomes overcooled, it is less efficient. During the power stroke, combustion heat pushes down the piston. If too much of this heat is lost to the cooling system, the gas-air mixture might not combust completely and fuel might run down the cylinder walls and wash off the lubricating oil. 
If this happens, enough gasoline might enter the oil pan to dilute the oil, diminishing its lubricating ability. Although older automobiles used water as a coolant, all vehicles today use an ethylene glycol mixture, antifreeze, and water for both cooling the engine block and keeping it from freezing. Freezing liquid in the radiator and block can permanently damage those components. Depending on the percentage of antifreeze coolant used, the engine can be protected from both freezing and overheating. Radiator The radiator mounts in front of the engine and contains a top tank, a bottom tank, and a center core, heat exchanger. An engine accessory belt drives the coolant pump to circulate coolant throughout the engine and then into the radiator. Hot coolant passes from the engine to the top tank. It enters the radiator core and heat exchanger through a series of small copper or aluminum distribution tubes. The heat dissipates from the liquid and into the wall of the tubes. Air circulated through the core takes the heat from the fins around those tubes, then the cold liquid flows into the bottom tank and is drawn back into the engine. The radiator pressure cap is on the top tank of the radiator and can be removed to add coolant to the radiator. When the coolant becomes hot and expands, a pressure relief mechanism in the radiator cap allows the coolant to pass through an overflow tube to a coolant recovery tank. When the system cools down, the coolant is drawn through the overflow by vacuum and re-enters the radiator. Fans While the vehicle is moving, air moves through the grill and the radiator core to provide sufficient cooling. However, when the engine is running but the automobile is not moving, there isn't sufficient natural air flow through the radiator core, so fans are necessary to keep the engine and radiator from overheating. In many automobiles, the fan mounts to the inside of the front grille and uses the same pulley that drives the coolant pump. When the engine is running, a drive belt turns the pulley to turn the fan, and the fan pulls air through the radiator core. On many front-wheel drive cars, the engine is mounted sideways in the engine compartment, which means the fan cannot be mounted on the front of the engine. In this situation, the fan mounts to a sheet metal or plastic housing, fan shroud, that attaches to the radiator and increases the amount of air moved by the fan. Fuel System The fuel system is responsible for storing enough fuel for several hundred miles of vehicle operation, delivering the fuel to the engine, and mixing the fuel with air in the proper proportions for efficient combustion. The two fuel systems that you need to know are the gasoline and diesel fuel systems. Fuels Different types of engines use different types of fuels, which are not interchangeable. If your gasoline engine is rated for flex fuel, that just means that it can take either gasoline only or a blend of up to 85% ethanol, E85. Except for a few engine and fuel system modifications, these engines are identical to gasoline-only models. Gasoline and gasoline combustion properties Gasoline is a petroleum-based hydrocarbon fuel and is the most common fuel for non-commercial cars and trucks. There are many thousands of hydrocarbons, and every batch of gasoline has a different mix, depending on the crude oil it came from and the refining process it underwent. Gasoline is a mixture of the lightest or most volatile liquid hydrocarbons found in crude petroleum oil. Normal combustion is the proper burning of air and fuel in the combustion chamber. Gasoline engines use a spark from the spark plug to ignite the air-fuel mix, spark ignition. In this case, the spark starts the combustion, the explosion expands evenly through the air-fuel mixture in the combustion chamber, and the force of the combustion pushes down the piston. However, two kinds of combustion indicate problems with the detonation or burning process. Detonation, abnormal combustion in which only a portion of the air-fuel mix combusts initially then the remaining portion ignites. This secondary explosion applies extreme hammering pressures on the piston and other engine parts. And the extreme heat damages spark plugs and pistons. Pre-ignition, a result of deposits from fuel and oil buildup in the combustion chamber. These deposits cause high internal pressure and reduce heat transfer to the coolant. The trapped heat then raises the temperature of the air-fuel mix to the point that it Combusts before ignition. This occurs especially when the engine has a heavy operating load or in hot weather. Pre-ignition also causes the engine to run after you turn off the ignition. 
Because some gasoline hydrocarbons are more likely to self-ignite and cause detonation, researchers sought means of reducing these combustion problems by modifying the characteristics of the gasoline. This is why you have different fuel options at the gas pump. Leaded fuel, no longer available, but is gasoline that contains tetraethyl lead to minimize engine knock. The lead slows the wall of flame in the combustion chamber and reduces detonation. However, much of the highly poisonous lead leaves with the exhaust gases and goes into the air. Unleaded fuel has an increased antinoch rating because of a synthesizing process that converts gasoline hydrocarbon molecules to synthetic hydrocarbons with a higher octane rating. The octane rating is the manner for rating gasoline combustion and anti-detonation properties. Premium gasoline is a high octane fuel, whereas regular gasoline has a low octane rating. Octane ratings indicate a fuel comparison with a mixture of ISO octane that has a 100 octane rating and heptane that has a zero octane rating. The octane rating that you see on the gas pump is an average of the comparative octane numbers. Volatility measures the flammable stability of fuel. Good gasoline contains a mix of liquids with different boiling points, so that some liquids evaporate at low temperatures to start easily in cold weather and other, less volatile liquids vaporize as the engine warms up. The more volatile a liquid is, the higher octane it is. Although many things can interfere with a gasoline's performance, here are a few of the most common. Crude oil contains sulfur, which refining processes reduce. Sulfur is undesirable because it forms corrosive acids, causes wear and deposits in the engine, reduces octane, and interferes with antinoch additives. Fuel deicer additives prevent fuel line freeze-up and carburetor icing. When tank condensation freezes, it blocks fuel flow to the carburetor. Deicer additives are either antifreeze solvents or surface active agents that coat ice particles to keep them from sticking to metal surfaces. Diesel fuel and diesel combustion properties Diesel engines use the heat of high compression to ignite the air-fuel mixture, and for that reason, diesel fuel is ranked by its cetane rating, which measures heat value, how much heat energy it supplies when burned, instead of combustion properties such as gasoline. Diesel has a higher heat value than gasoline, but it is less volatile. Diesel has a low viscosity index, and because of that, it can pass through the injectors easily in warm weather, but thickens too much to flow properly in cold weather. For this reason, diesel is available in several grades during the winter months. Winterized diesel fuel, grade D1, is less viscous than diesel for normal operating temperatures, grade D2. The ignition quality rating, the cetane rating, of a diesel fuel is similar to the octane rating given to gasoline, and is rated on a scale from 100 to 0. A cetane hydrocarbon has good ignition quality and carries a rating of 100. If a fuel has the same ignition quality as a 70% cetane mixture, the fuel receives a cetane rating of 70. As with octane ratings, cetane numbers are posted on the fuel pump. Diesel vehicle owners' manuals specify what cetane number fuel to use. Biofuels The third kind of fuel that you will likely see is biofuel. Unlike petroleum products, which are fossil fuels, biofuels are derived from plant material and from recycled waste material, such as used vegetable oil. Agrofuels are produced from specific crops, such as those high in sugar or starch, sugar beets and corn, or plants high in vegetable oil, soybeans. Heating these oils reduces their viscosity so that they can be used directly in diesel engines, or they can be processed to produce fuels such as biodiesel. The biofuel that you will see most often is a blend of gasoline and ethanol, which is a corn biofuel. Wood and its byproducts can also be converted into biofuels, such as wood gas, methanol, or ethanol fuel. In addition, wood and grasses can be dried and formed into pellets to burn for power production. Although this produces some waste, the processing uses less energy and gives higher overall efficiency. Fuel tank the fuel tank stores the fuel and normally mounts to the vehicle's undercarriage. If the vehicle's engine is in the front, the fuel tank is in the rear, and vice versa. Placement of the tank away from the engine distributes weight and lowers the risk of fire. Baffles in the tanks keep the fuel from sloshing around and shifting weight. By reducing agitation, 
The baffles also keep condensed moisture from entering fuel lines. Cool nights cause condensation on the inner surface of the fuel tank. Because water and gasoline do not mix, the water, which is heavier, settles to the bottom of the tank. Fuel filters and sediment bowls minimize water infiltration in the carburetor, as does the practice of keeping the fuel tank full. A screen in the fuel pickup line blocks large particles in the tank from entering the fuel lines. In vehicles with a float pickup, fuel is taken from just below the surface of the fuel instead of at the bottom to reduce water intake. Keeping the fuel level high reduces condensation on the inside of the tank. Fuel is distributed from the tank to the fuel pump in the engine compartment via fuel lines, which are steel tubing except where movement of the line is necessary, in which case the lines are synthetic rubber. Fuel Pumps The fuel pump draws fuel out of the tank and pumps a steady stream into the carburetor. The two types of fuel pumps are as follows. Electric fuel pumps can mount anywhere in or out of the engine compartment, usually near or inside the fuel tank. Turning the key in the ignition activates the electric motor, and an oil pressure switch stops the fuel pump if the engine stops. Electric pumps deliver more fuel than the carburetor needs, so excess fuel is diverted at the pressure regulator and flows under low pressure back to the fuel tank. A check valve prevents an abrupt drop of pressure in the fuel line when the engine stops. Mechanical fuel pumps mount on the engine block and operate by an eccentric on the engine camshaft that moves the pump rocker arm. The mechanical pumping action to the carburetor results from motion in the rocker arm on the crankshaft. The fuel pump furnishes more fuel than the wide open carburetor needs, so the pump does not operate when the float valve in the carburetor is closed. Fuel filters Gasoline going to the carburetor must be clean to keep from clogging the carburetor jets and passages. Most fuel systems have inline filters between the fuel pump and the carburetor to remove water and impurities from the fuel. Most inline filters consist of a plastic canister with a paper filter element. The gasoline enters one end and flows through the element and to the outlet to the carburetor. Diesel engines require very clean fuel for proper operation, so water, acids, and particulate must be removed from the fuel before it enters the injection system. Most diesel fuel systems include both in tank and in line fuel filters, as well as a water fuel separator. A typical diesel fuel filter consists of a metal canister with a paper element. The water fuel separator sits between the fuel tank and the fuel filter. A float valve or sensor activates a lamp in the instrument panel that indicates when the separator should be drained. Carburetors and Carburation The carburation system is the part of the engine system that mixes and distributes the air-fuel mixture. The component that helps facilitate this is the carburetor, which mixes fuel with air in the proper proportions to burn efficiently inside the cylinder. Carburetors all have similar parts and operate by the same principle. A carburetor on a gasoline engine performs three jobs, which are metering, atomization, and fuel distribution through the air flowing into the engine. Atomization and vaporization, gasoline must be broken into fine particles, atomized, before the engine can use it. The carburetor draws gasoline into the incoming air stream as a spray and atomizes it so that it will vaporize and combust easily. The resulting air-fuel mixture is drawn into the intake manifold, where the fuel mist vaporizes. Lessened air pressure in the intake manifold lowers the vaporization point of the gasoline, so that it combusts more easily than at normal air pressure. Metering, to burn efficiently, the air and fuel that the carburetor draws in must be in the correct ratio. The carburetor meters this ratio during all engine speeds and loads. It takes about 15 pounds of air to completely burn 1 pound of gasoline, for a ratio of a 15 colon 1 air-fuel mix. More fuel gives a richer mixture, and less fuel gives a leaner mixture. Air-fuel ratios are based on weight, not volume, because air and fuel volumes change with pressure or temperature, but weight remains unaffected. Most engines will operate on air-fuel ratios from 11 colon 1, very rich, to 17 colon 1, slightly lean, depending on operating conditions. Exam alert. Be sure that you know the correct air-fuel ratio for normal gasoline engine operation, which is about 15 colon 1. Distribution. For good burning and smooth engine operation, 
Air and fuel must be uniformly mixed, must be delivered in equal amounts to each cylinder, and must be evenly distributed within the combustion chamber. After the air and fuel are atomized, the air-fuel mixture passes through to the intake manifold and cylinders. The manifold creates the vacuum that causes the air stream. In addition, as the pistons move down on the intake strokes, that action creates a vacuum in the combustion chamber. Because the intake valves are open during the intake stroke, the vacuum extends to the intake manifold. Fuel Injection Delivering a precise amount of air and fuel to the engine gives the greatest power and economy, along with the lowest emissions. Diesel engines use mechanical fuel injection to deliver fuel directly into the compressed air inside the cylinder. This system uses a pump to force pressurized fuel into injectors in each combustion chamber. On the intake stroke, only air is pulled into the cylinder. When the engine is ready for the power stroke, the injectors spray a small quantity of fuel into the compressed air. Diesel fuel injection systems differ from those of gasoline engines. Gasoline engine fuel injectors are in the intake manifold, whereas diesel engine injectors are in a swirl chamber inside the combustion chamber. In addition, diesel engines use mechanical fuel injectors to accurately time the fuel injection and hydraulics to overcome pressure in the combustion chamber. Most gasoline engines use electronic fuel injection. In continuous flow fuel injection, a high pressure pump forces fuel to injector nozzles mounted in the intake manifold very near the engine's intake valves. The injectors provide a continuous stream of fuel on demand to accommodate high fuel delivery rates for high speed operation. This system is less efficient than the mechanical type, but is also less complicated. Gasoline engines use electronic fuel injection, EFI, which places the fuel spray nozzles in the intake manifold near each of the cylinder's intake valves. Pressurized fuel is pumped to the nozzles. The nozzles are electronically controlled to ensure that the fuel injected at any given moment is precisely the amount that the engine needs. Sensors on the engine tell the control unit the actual load condition, engine speed, and operating temperature. Controlling the fuel injection so precisely lowers emissions and improves fuel mileage. Air filters The engine pulls in a tremendous amount of air. The air filter cleans the dust and dirt from the air before it enters the engine. This large housing is above the carburetor or fuel injection assembly. Inside the housing is a paper or polyurethane foam filter that air passes through to filter out dirt and dust. The drivetrain. The power that the engine develops is delivered to the driving wheels of the automobile by the powertrain, drivetrain. The transmission and the differential make up the two sets of gears in the drivetrain. The transmission adjusts the gear ratio, while the differential lets the drive wheels turn at different speeds. Transmissions. The transmission multiplies the torque developed by the engine, changing the speed and power between the engine and the driving wheels. Front-wheel drive cars combine the transmission and the differential in one housing to form a transaxle. Figure 9.4 illustrates a basic drive train configuration. The two types of transmission are automatic and manual. The transmission changes the ratio of the engine speed and the wheels by connecting gears in various combinations. If a gear with 10 teeth is driving a gear with 20 teeth, the drive has a 2 colon 1 ratio, as Chapter 7 discusses. Automotive engines develop low torque at low revolutions per minute, and the transmission provides a way to change the gear ratio between the engine and the driving wheels. Although gear ratios differ for different automobiles, a 3-speed engine in low gear carries a gear ratio through the transmission of about 3 colon 1. Second gear has a 2 colon 1 ratio. When the vehicle is moving fast enough, the automobile no longer requires torque multiplication through the transmission, so the high gear has a 1 colon 1 ratio. An overdrive gear has a gear ratio of higher than 1 colon 1. The advantage of an overdrive is that the engine turns more slowly for any given speed, resulting in longer engine life and decreased fuel consumption. Manual transmissions Manual tra
Manual transmissions. Manual transmissions usually have one reverse gear speed and four forward gear speeds, and often have a fifth overdrive gear that lets the output shaft turn faster than the input shaft for better highway fuel consumption. A manual transmission has a manually operated clutch pedal that the driver presses to uncouple the engine from the powertrain and shift gears. When the driver has shifted gears, the clutch pedal is released to recouple the engine and powertrain. Before the driver can crank the automobile, the engine must be disengaged from the powertrain. Automatic transaxle and transmission Functionally, an automatic transmission does the same job as a manual clutch and transmission, which is increasing the engine's output torque to move the automobile. However, an automatic transmission is easier to drive than a manual transmission because it changes gears without the driver shifting. Each shift of the gears is controlled by a shift valve and the gears. Rear wheel drive. Change according to speed, the road quality, and load conditions. Automatic transmissions normally use three forward gears and a reverse gear. The engagement and shifting in an automatic transmission or transaxle is done automatically by the torque converter, the planetary gearbox, and the hydraulic control system. The torque converter is a coupling between the engine and the gearbox that evens out speed changes and multiplies engine torque, while the planetary gearbox helps the converter increase torque. The hydraulic control system senses driving conditions and then regulates the hydraulic pressure to the transmission and shifts the transmission to the correct gear. Transmission fluid Transmission fluid lubricates all the gears and shafts in the transmission to keep it running smoothly. Like engine oil, transmission fluid, often called automatic transmission fluid, or ATF, is available as a petroleum-based or synthetic product. Synthetic is often a good choice for transmissions that work hard, such as those that haul heavy loads. Always check your transmission fluid when you check your oil or if you notice that your car isn't shifting well. The transmission fluid has its own dipstick, located in the engine compartment, and markings on the stick tell you whether you need to add fluid. A dark transmission fluid might indicate that you need to change the fluid. Never use any other type of oil in your transmission except transmission fluid, and that according to the specs for your vehicle. However, color alone is not a reliable indicator of whether your ATF should be changed, as most fluids will darken with use. Always follow the manufacturer's recommended service interval, and use the type of fluid that the manufacturer specifies. Old transmission fluid has reduced lubrication properties and abrasive materials, from clutches and brake bands, in it. Failing to change your ATF increases transmission wear, and could ruin your transmission. Drive Line Arrangements the drive line is the assembly responsible for getting engine torque to the drive wheels. Front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, and four wheel drive vehicles arrange the transmission slash transaxles in different configurations, as discussed here. Front wheel drive, FWD. Front wheel drive vehicles combine the transmission and differential to form the transaxle, which mounts directly to the engine, which normally sits crosswise on front wheel drive cars. Two drive shafts deliver the power from the transaxle to the front wheels. The advantage of front wheel drive is that combining the transmission and differential into one housing makes the car lighter, which saves fuel. In addition, because the lengthwise drive shaft and drive shaft tunnel are eliminated, the vehicle has more passenger space. Rear wheel drive, RWD. In rear wheel drive cars, the engine mounts lengthwise, and the clutch housing and transmission bolt to the rear of the engine. A single long drive shaft delivers the torque from the transmission in the front of the vehicle to the rear differential and rear axle. Because the transmission is stationary, but the rear axle assembly is spring-mounted and can move up and down. The drive shaft must allow for movement, and the drive line must be able to make changes in both angle and length to compensate for uneven terrain. The drive shaft must also adjust in length, because the distance between the transmission and the rear axle changes as the rear axle moves up and down. For wheel drive, for WD. A four-wheel drive arrangement allows all four wheels to transfer engine torque to the road. 
In four-wheel drive vehicles, the engine mounts lengthwise and uses a transmission and transfer case, which is a system of gears that mount in a separate housing behind the transmission. Two drive shafts, one from the transfer case to the front axle and one from the transmission to the rear axle, transmit transmission torque. The two transfer case types are part-time and full-time transfer cases. In a four-wheel drive vehicle, the part-time transfer case always has one drive axle automatically in use, but the driver must activate and deactivate the second drive axle. In this way, the vehicle can use two-wheel drive during normal driving for fuel economy, but can use four-wheel drive on rough or slippery roads. The full-time transfer case provides full-time torque to all four wheels. Both types of transfer case also provide a gear reduction range lower than the transmission's low gear, to increase vehicle power in steep conditions. All-wheel drive, AWD. All-wheel drive vehicles use both live front and rear drive axles. When the front and rear drive axles receive power from the transfer case, the vehicle can function well on off-road terrain, such as sand, rocks, mud, and snow. An all-wheel drive vehicle has both axles live at all times without manually activating or deactivating them. Drivetrain Components The primary drivetrain components consist of the transmission, or transaxle, transfer case drive shaft, differential, universal joints, and slip joints. We discuss each of these components in the following sections. Drive Shaft The drive shaft is a steel tube that transmits power from the transmission output shaft to the rear axle. To accommodate different wheelbases and transmission combinations, drive shafts have different lengths, diameters, and types of splined yokes. Because of the vibration that drive shafts experience, some drive shafts have rubber biscuits molded on the outside of the smaller diameter steel tube. This assembly is then pressed into the drive shaft tubes. Universal joint. The universal joint consists of two Y-shaped yokes connected by a crossmember. In a typical drive line, the front and rear universal joints are identical in construction and operation. Universal joints make it possible for one shaft to drive another when they are at an angle. Slip joints. The front yoke of the universal joint called the slip joint, has splines that mesh to the external splines of the transmission output shaft. Because the rear axle moves up and down on the suspension, when the vehicle is on rough terrain, the distance between the transmission and the rear axle subsequently changes. For this reason, the drive shaft is not anchored at the front, and the slip joint moves in and out on the transmission shaft to allow this change of distance. The slip joint spline fits snugly onto the transmission output shaft and is free to move in and out. Differential assembly The differential allows two drive wheels to turn at different speeds when the vehicle goes around a corner because the wheel on the inside of the turn travels through a smaller arc than the wheel on the outside of the corner. If the wheels could not turn at different speeds, they would tend to skip around the corner and make steering very difficult. On front-wheel drive cars, the differential is in the same housing as the transmission and is called the transaxle. On rear-wheel drive cars, the differential is at the rear of the car in the rear axle assembly. Exam alert. Make sure you know that the differential is located in the drivetrain and that on front-wheel drive cars it is combined with the transmission in the transaxle, but that it is in the rear axle assembly on rear-wheel drive cars. Electrical systems. The electrical system serves two main functions, to supply the electrical energy to start and operate the engine, and to provide power to operate lights, instruments, and other electrical accessories. Figure 9.5 illustrates the automotive electrical subsystems, which consist of the charging, starting, ignition, and lighting and accessory systems. Because automotive electrical systems contain the same aspects and components of other electrical systems, such as live voltage and capacitors, which, as you should recall, store electricity. You should always practice the sound safety precautions discussed in Chapter 6, Electronics Information. Caution The discussion in this section focuses on the over-
The discussion in this section focuses on the overall task of these subsystems. We provided a detailed discussion on electronics, electricity, and electron theory earlier, in Chapter 6. If you understand the material in that chapter, you are prepared to understand automotive electrical systems. Most particularly, you should be sure that you understand these principles and components. Electron flow Common terms and measurements, such as voltage, current, and resistance. Common electronic components, such as conductors, resistors, and transistors. Electric circuits Magnetism, electromagnetism, and induction. Charging system The automobile must always have electrical energy available to operate the engine and power the electrical accessories. The charging system provides this energy by extracting stored energy from the battery and generating electrical power to replace what was used. The charging system contains three primary components, the battery, alternator, and regulator. Battery The battery is the stored energy source that provides power to the starter motor, the ignition system, and the critical systems and accessories when the engine is not running. It also provides reserve power when the alternator cannot supply all the electrical power that the car needs. Ignition System Ignition Coil Automobiles use lead-acid storage batteries to store chemical energy and convert it to electrical energy. When the engine is running, the charging system powers the electrical system and recharges the battery. Most vehicles use 12-volt batteries, but large equipment, that needs higher voltages uses two 12-volt batteries connected in series to supply 24 volts. The battery has a hard plastic case with internal cell partitions, and the end cells have battery terminals that connect to them. The polarity of each terminal is indicated as positive, POS or plus, or negative, NEG or, by markings on the battery case near the terminal. From these terminals, the battery connects to the electrical circuit. The top of the battery might have threaded or tapered caps over the cells. You can remove the cap to inspect and refill the water in the cell. The cap has a vent to allow hydrogen and oxygen gases to escape during charging. A maintenance-free battery does not have cell vent caps. Alternator The alternator must replace electrical energy that an automobile draws from the battery, or the battery will completely discharge and you will have a dead battery on your hands, as when you forget and leave your car lights on. The alternator contains a rotor, a stator, and a rectifier in a cast aluminum housing, because aluminum is non-magnetic and lightweight, and provides good heat dissipation. The alternator works by taking the motion from the rotor to develop electromagnetic induction in the stator coils. Because the alternator has an alternating current, AC, output, the rectifier changes the AC input to direct current DC, output that the car and battery can use, because both are DC systems. Regulator Alternator output voltages increase and decrease with the speed of the rotor. Too much current or voltage output from the alternator can damage the automobile's electrical system and battery. For that reason, electrical output from the alternator passes through a voltage regulator. The regulator keeps the charging output between 13.5 and 14.5 volts. The voltage regulator also controls the amount of rotor field current in the alternator. Starting System The starting system puts out enough power to crank the engine fast enough to start it. The starting system has five main components. Battery, also part of the charging system. Starter motor and drive. Solenoid Key switch, also part of the ignition system The starting system uses power from the battery to begin the starting process, and the driver controls the starting system via the ignition switch. Because we discuss the key switch, ignition, and the battery elsewhere in this chapter, this discussion focuses on the components we do not cover elsewhere, which are the starter and the solenoid. The starter a three-piece housing holds the two major parts of the starter, which are a field winding and an armature. Current passes through the field windings and the armature in series, called a series wound motor, to provide a cranking power to start the engine, which requires that the crankshaft rotate at a fairly high speed. 
The starter motor drive meshes the pinion with the engine flywheel to crank the engine, and UN meshes them when the engine begins to run. The starter motor converts electrical energy from the battery into mechanical energy to crank the engine. Using electromagnetic induction, the field winding in the starter motor increases the strength of the current and voltage from the battery and stabilizes the output. The solenoid The solenoid is a magnetically operated switch that controls the circuit between the battery and the starter motor. Because the starter motor requires full battery current to operate, large cables must be used for current from the battery. Because voltage drop in the cable makes it unfeasible to key the starter motor from the ignition, the solenoid acts like a remote switch. The driver controls the solenoid operation with the ignition switch. Most starting systems also have a neutral or clutch switch to prevent the engine from being started when the transmission is in gear. Diesel Starting Systems The diesel engines have problems with cold starts because they use compression ignition. When the engine is first cranked, the air entering the engine is cold, and while the compression stroke increases air temperature, the cold combustion chamber absorbs most of the heat. This means that the air temperature is still too low for ignition. Glow plugs are part of a preheating system that warms up the cylinders to allow the engine to start. The glow plug is an electrically heated wire filament that fits into the combustion chamber of each cylinder of the engine. When the driver activates the ignition key, a weight lamp illuminates on the instrument panel while the glow plugs are heating up. When the weight lamp goes off, the combustion chambers are warm enough for starting. After the engine starts, the glow plugs remain on for a short time and then automatically extinguish. Ignition System The ignition system provides a series of precisely timed high-voltage sparks to ignite the compressed air-fuel mixture in the combustion chamber. These are the main components of the ignition system. Battery and or alternator, also part of the charging system. Ignition key switch, also part of the ignition system. Ignition coil. Distributor. As many spark plugs as there are cylinders. When you activate the ignition switch, that action closes the distributor contact points. Current flows from the power source through the key switch into the primary terminal on the ignition coil. The ignition coil steps up the voltage and sends it out through the secondary terminal into the distributor. Ignition Switch The ignition system provides a high voltage spark to each cylinder so that the air-fuel mixture ignites at precisely the right time. 12 volts in the primary circuit are boosted by the coil to 30,000 or more volts at the spark plug. By turning the key in the ignition switch, the driver can control the entire ignition event. Ignition Coil The ignition coil steps up the 12 volts available from the battery, or alternator, to a voltage high enough to arc at the spark plug gap and ignite the air-fuel mixture. The ignition coil's primary winding has about 200 turns of heavy copper wire, and the secondary has about 2,100 turns of fine copper wire. Recall the discussion on step-up transformers in Chapter 6. The ignition coil operates on the same principle. The ignition coil is inside a one-piece steel case filled with tar, epoxy, or oil to displace air. The case has a primary and secondary terminal on the outside for each set of windings. Distributor The distributor helps the coil develop high voltage, distributes the high voltage to each of the cylinders, and gets the high voltage to the cylinders at the correct time. The distributor delivers high voltage from the coil through the spark plug wires to each of the engine's spark plugs. When current jumps across the spark plug gap, it creates a spark that ignites the air-fuel mixture. Spark Plugs To create a spark in the combustion chamber, the spark plug must have a sufficient gap over which an electrical charge can arc. If the gap were not present, the electrical charge would simply transmit by conductance and would not create an open spark to ignite the air-fuel mixture. If the spark plug and the rest of the ignition system are in good condition, the air-fuel mixture in the cylinder burns smoothly, developing power with very little pollution. Spark plugs must be the right size for the combustion chamber, and different spark plug sizes are required for different engine designs. Plug wires transmit the voltage from the distributor to the spark plugs. Lighting and Accessory System 
The lighting and accessory system consists of many small circuits that operate the lights and accessories on an automobile, such as these. Headlights Stop lights Turn signal indicators Instrument panel lamps Gauges Horns The system also includes hundreds of feet of wiring that connects these devices to the power source and the many control switches that operate them. The chassis systems The chassis includes all parts of the automobile except the body and the primary systems that we have already discussed. The chassis systems include the steering, suspension, braking, and emission systems, as well as the tires and wheels. The steering system The steering system allows the driver to control the direction of the automobile. The steering system consists of the steering gears to multiply the driver's effort at the steering wheel, and the steering linkage that connects the gearbox to the front wheels. The performance of the system is dependent upon proper front wheel alignment for directional control and ease of steering. The steering wheel attaches to a shaft that runs toward the front of the automobile and enters the steering gearbox. This box has two gears, one attaches to the steering shaft and the other attaches to the front wheel linkage. The steering gears change the rotary motion of the steering wheel into straight line motion that moves the steering linkage. They also provide a gear reduction that makes the automobile easier to steer. The types of steering are as follows. Rack and pinion connects the steering wheel and shaft to a small pinion gear that meshes with the teeth on top of a long bar rack so that turning the steering wheel turns the pinion gear. The rack attaches to the steering linkage that turns the wheels. Because rack and pinion systems use very little space, they are suitable for compact vehicles. Power steering reduces the driver's steering effort by using a pump, usually engine-driven with a belt, to connect to hydraulic lines and then to a cylinder or directly to the steering gearbox. Variable ratio steering, used in most power steering, and uses a rack and pinion gear set that has a different number of teeth in the center than it does on the outside of the gear. This makes the car respond quickly when starting a turn and reduces effort near the wheel's turning limits. All cars today use a collapsible steering column. In a hard front-end collision, the engine and steering linkage are often forced against the steering gearbox, pushing the shaft into the automobile. To prevent serious injury, the steering shaft and steering column are made from two pieces that extend like a telescope. During a collision, the column and shaft absorb the energy, and the shaft collapses back into the column. The Suspension System the automobile's wheels are mounted to the framework through a system of linkages and springs called the suspension system. The suspension system allows the wheels to bounce up and down on rough roads, while the rest of the vehicle remains fairly stable. These are the primary components of a suspension system. Control arms attach the wheels to the frame. The steering knuckle and spindle are mounts for the wheels. Ball joints support suspension system control linkages. The stabilizer bar reduces body motion. The coil spring dissipates chassis movement. The torsion bar twists at a controlled rate to act as a spring. Shock absorbers are hydraulic devices that control the up and down and rolling motion of the automobile body and control wheel and axle movement. Several different suspension designs are available, as discussed in the next sections. Independent suspensions in most independent suspension systems, each wheel on the driving axle regardless of whether it is a front or rear wheel drive is independent of the other. If the left wheel falls into a hole, the right wheel is unaffected. This suspension type is common in front engine, front wheel drive vehicles. In it, the rear wheels are suspended independently from a rear cross member by arms that go to the back or by a trailing arm independent rear suspension. Short long arm suspension. This is the most common type of independent suspension. In this system, the front wheels connect to the frame by an upper and a lower control arm that attach to the frame in such a way that they can swivel up and down. The wheels turn on wheel bearings that attach to the steering knuckle, and the steering knuckle connects to the control arms through a ball joint. The ball joint allows movement in many directions so that the assembly can swing around as the wheels are turned left and right. It also permits up and down motion on rough roads. 
McPherson Strut Suspension This type of suspension uses a single lower control arm that connects to a long, tubular assembly, a strut, that is supported by the coil spring at the upper end and by the lower control arm at the bottom. A ball joint attaches to the lower part of the spindle. Most front-wheel drive vehicles use the McPherson strut design. Rigid Rear Suspension Systems This is the suspension type that most rear-drive automobiles use. It consists of a rigid rear axle that mounts to the frame through a spring system. Each side of the rear axle housing connects to the frame through a spring and a shock absorber. The spring absorbs the wheel and axle movement so that the frame, body, and passengers do not bounce. Load Leveling Systems These suspension systems compensate for heavy loads added to the trunk or rear of a vehicle. In weighted conditions, the lowering of the rear affects the operation of both the front and rear suspension, making the vehicle difficult to control. Automatic leveling systems automatically maintain the correct rear height as weight is added to or removed from the vehicle. The braking system The braking system is the most important safety feature on an automobile. The heart of the brake system is a master cylinder that connects to the brake pedal. Pushing on the brake pedal causes the master cylinder to force hydraulic fluid through brake lines out to each of the automobile's four wheels. The hydraulic fluid activates the wheel brake assembly on each wheel to use friction to stop the rotation of the wheel. The master cylinder consists of a brake fluid container and a piston in a cylinder. A hole in the bottom of the brake fluid container allows brake fluid to fill the area in front of the piston. When the brake pedal is pushed, the piston is pushed forward in the cylinder. As the piston covers the hole, the fluid is trapped and forced out of a line at the back of the cylinder. This fluid is then directed through lines to each of the wheel brake assemblies. Two types of wheel brake assemblies are in use. Drum brakes. Drum brakes are an older brake system, but are still used in many small automobiles and on the rear wheels of some larger vehicles. The brake drum is a large, drum-shaped iron casting that attaches to each wheel with lug bolts and turns with the wheel. When the driver presses the brake pedal, the brake shoes press against the drums to stop the vehicle. Brake shoes are half circles with a high-friction brake lining. When the brake lining contacts the rotating brake drum, the friction between the lining and the drum stops the drum. Disc brakes. Disc brakes also use a master cylinder and brake lines, but instead of a drum, the disc brake system uses a rotor, which is a thick, round piece of cast iron attached to the wheel through the lug bolts and always turns when the wheel turns. To stop, the disc brake system uses hydraulics to squeeze two brake pads against the surface of the rotor, creating friction to stop the rotor from turning. Emergency and Parking Brakes All automobiles have an emergency brake system for times when the regular brake system fails or to prevent a parked vehicle from rolling. The system is mechanical in design, so it will continue to work even in a complete hydraulic system failure. Emergency brakes usually operate only on the rear wheels. When the parking brake pedal is pushed down, or when the parking lever is pulled up, depending on your automobile's design. A cable that connects to the rear brake shoes pulls them into contact with the drums to prevent the drums and wheels from turning. Power Brake Systems Power brakes reduce the driver's braking effort, and there are two types. One type uses the intake manifold vacuum to apply effort through the master cylinder, and the other type uses hydraulic pressure developed by the power steering pump to operate a hydraulic booster that attaches to the master cylinder. Anti-lock brake systems Anti-skid, anti-lock, brake systems prevent the wheels from locking or skidding when the driver is braking heavily. An electrically controlled anti-skid system monitors the wheel rotation speeds as compared to overall vehicle speed. If any of the wheels lock up, the logic control unit senses the lockup and reduces pressure on that brake to control the skid. It then reapplies the hydraulic pressure to maintain the best braking action. This cycle can repeat about four times a second until the vehicle speed drops or the brake pedal is released. Tires and Wheels Tires provide a cushion between the road and the automobile wheels to absorb road shock and provide friction between the wheels and the road for good traction. 
This friction channels the power from the engine through the tires to the road for rapid acceleration, traction in turns, and responsive stopping during braking. Tires either can use an inner tube or can be tubeless. Tires with an inner tube have the tube inside the tire and both mount on the wheel rim. The inner tube is inflated by a valve stem that sticks through the tire. Tubeless tires mount directly on the rim and air is held between the rim and the tire casing. The amount of air pressure used in the tire varies with the size of the vehicle and its load. Tires are made by forming layers of cord, plies, over a spacing device, and then rubberizing them to form the carcass. A steel wire bead, enclosed in an overlap of the carcass fabric, keeps the carcass on the wheel rim. The rubber that forms the tread and sidewall is then vulcanized over the carcass. Although all tires are constructed of the same parts, they differ in the arrangement of the cord layers. Bias ply tires, place the layers of cords at an angle to form a crisscross pattern to allow the cords to expand and contract. This flexing gives the conventional bias ply the advantage of a smooth ride. Radial ply tires, place the cords at right angles, and a belt is added under the tread area of the tire. The combination of radial plies and belts gives a flexible sidewall that is rigid in the tread area, but it gives a harder ride at lower speeds. Belted bias ply tires, Soften the sidewall by adding belts, resulting in a better footprint than that of a conventional bias tire. Wheel alignment Wheel alignment refers to the position of the front and rear wheels in relation to the suspension. Proper alignment makes the automobile easy to turn and keeps it stable at high speeds. Wheel misalignment makes the vehicle difficult to steer and causes rapid tire wear. Although the suspension system has some alignment factors built into the design, other factors must be adjusted. Camber, the inward or outward tilt of the top of the tires. Caster, the backward or forward tilt of the center line of the ball joints. Steering axis inclination, the angle formed by the center line of the ball joints and the vertical center line. Toe in, situation in which the wheels are closer together at the front edge than at the rear edge. Turning radius, the relative angles of the two front wheels during a turn. Exhaust systems and emissions. When combustion is complete, an exhaust manifold that attaches to the cylinder head collects burned gases and sends them through the exhaust pipe, the catalytic converter, and the muffler. Exhaust manifold collects burned gases and sends them out through the exhaust pipe to the catalytic converter. Catalytic converter converts harmful pollutants into less harmful emissions before they leave the exhaust system. Muffler, muffles or quiets the noise resulting from hot, high-pressure gases exiting an internal combustion engine. Exhaust emissions Roughly 60% of pollutants are caused by exhaust gases. Emission controls work to eliminate or reduce pollutants that occur as a byproduct of burning carbon-based fuels. Exhaust gases contribute three major pollutants, hydrocarbons, nitrogen oxides, and carbon monoxide. Hydrocarbons Hydrocarbons, HC, consist of many hundreds of combinations of hydrogen and carbon-based atoms. All petroleum-based fuels are hydrocarbons. Burning gasoline in automobiles is The major source of hydrocarbon pollutants Because of unburned fuel in the system, the engine releases hydrocarbons into the air from the carburetor, gas tank, and crankcase vent. Positive crankcase ventilation, PCV, cleans up crankcase vapors by pulling blow-by, unburned fuel, and combustion by products created during the power stroke that leak past the piston rings into the crankcase, vapors out of the crankcase. Through a tube and into the intake manifold. The vapors enter the cylinders and are burned with the air-fuel mixture to reduce expelled hydrocarbons. Nitrogen oxides When temperatures in the combustion chamber get too hot, in excess of 2,500 degrees, nitrogen in the air combines with oxygen to form nitrogen oxides, NOx. When combined with hydrocarbons, NOx produces smog. An exhaust gas recirculation, EGR, system controls the emission of nitrogen oxides by reintroducing exhaust gases back into the air-fuel mixture in the intake stream. Because the exhaust gases cannot burn again, they act as an inert material to displace some of the normal intake charge to cool down and slow the combustion process. Carbon monoxide 
When an engine burns gasoline, it discharges carbon monoxide, CO, in the automobile exhaust. Inside an automobile operating in traffic, concentrations of CO can reach levels that are high enough to negatively affect the driver and create a safety hazard. Reducing Exhaust Emissions In addition to the methods mentioned when discussing the specific types of emissions, overall exhaust emissions can be reduced in two ways. Air injection system forces outside air into the exhaust system to reduce HC and CO emissions. The system injects air into the exhaust ports, into the catalytic converter, or into both places at different times. Depending on model application and system configuration. Catalytic converter uses a three-way catalyst to remove hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides from exhaust gas. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction, but is not changed itself. The three primary catalysts used in the converter are platinum, palladium, and rhodium. Most catalytic converters implement a three-way reduction process. The reduction catalyst uses platinum and rhodium to help reduce NOx emissions. When the NOx in unburned fuel contacts the catalyst, the catalyst oxidizes the nitrous oxides by stripping the nitrogen atom from the molecule and releasing the oxygen as O. 2. The free nitrogen atoms bond together to form N. 2. The oxidation catalyst reduces unburned hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide by burning, oxidizing, them over a platinum and palladium catalyst to facilitate the reaction of the carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons with the remaining oxygen in the exhaust gas. The control system monitors the exhaust stream via an oxygen sensor and uses this information to control fuel injection. The oxygen sensor assesses how much oxygen is in the exhaust. And the engine computer adjusts the air to fuel ratio to make sure that there is enough oxygen in the exhaust to allow the oxidization catalyst to work correctly.